Hello and welcome to another episode of Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today we have Ron White with us. I'm super excited. I met Ron at a uh, Laurel Langmire Big Table Mastermind event. He was a speaker, I was a speaker, and we chatted afterwards, and uh, yeah, I just had to have him on this show. Ron is a two-time national memory champion. He won the USA Memory Championships in 2009 and in 2010. Ron held the record for the fastest to memorize a deck of shuffled cards in only one minute and 27 seconds. He held this record for two years and is a top memory expert. His YouTube channel is one of the most viewed memory expert YouTube channels in the world. He's also appeared on Good Morning America, The Martha Stewart Show, Fox and Friends, the CBS Evening News, CBS Early Show, Fox, and NBC. Great to have you on the show, Ron. Hey, it's great to uh, be on the show with you. I always learn so much from you, whether it's learning about SEO when we met or just right now learning about my own microphone. So I always learn from you, so I'm looking forward to what I'm going to learn from you in this hour while I'm talking to you about what I do. Oh, that's awesome. So... Ron, you had just uh, such a great style of presenting. Not only did you convey very useful information to the audience, you did it in a way that was so entertaining. Did you learn like uh, stand-up comedy or something like uh, improv? Like, how are you so good on stage? Uh, I appreciate that. That's honestly, I think that's one of the best compliments somebody could give me, and I really appreciate you saying that because. Uh, I think that's what I like to say that maybe differentiates me uh, in in my field is just the funness that I try to have when I present it. But, um, you know, people always say you used to hold, you know, and they're talking to me, I used to hold the record for the fastest to memorize a deck of cards, these other memory records. And then they'll, they'll always say, do you have some natural ability? And I'll say, I do not have a natural ability. My memory is equal to yours. There's no difference at all. If there is any gift or natural ability I have, it's in the fun way that I can present it, and I will accept that as a natural ability. But I, but also I, I will say it's a lot of hard work. The presentation you saw me give, uh, I've been given for 28 years now, and I've probably given it near um, 2,000 times. So you know, you go and you give the presentation, and there's a you say something, and somebody laughs, and you're like, "Oh, I'm going to keep that in," you know. And then the next time you add it in, and so then it just becomes a highlight reel of your 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 best jokes. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense, and uh, I do a bit of that myself. I, I wait for the audience's reaction, and then yeah, it goes up here and filed away for next time if if it landed well. So. You have um, an approach where you teach folks and and uh, get them to practice using their memory. It's what an hour a day, ten minutes a day, uh, five minutes a day. What's what's kind of the necessary amount of practice that would really make you world class in in your memory, or at least better than anybody else you knew? Like if, for our listener who's uh, curious about be, becoming better at, at remembering people's names or remembering, uh, I don't know, funny jokes and that sort of stuff. I think with, as in regarding it to memory, the work is all almost all front-loaded. And, and what I mean by that is the first day, two, three days, the first week, You're actually going to have to take time to learn the system, to learn how your mind memorizes and operates. And so that first week, you're going to spend more time than you would spend in any other week for the rest of your life devoted to the memory systems. But once you have an understanding and you know how it works, then it just becomes maintenance. And really, it doesn't necessarily have to be you're going to sit down and dedicate 10 minutes. It could just be as you go throughout your day. The language of our memory is pictures. So the biggest obstacle you will have in getting faster and better with your memory is creating pictures or images for things that you want to remember. For example, names. Uh, You meet somebody named Lisa. You think, oh, my gosh, what's a good picture to remember the name Lisa? Oh, I'll think of the Mona Lisa, the painting. Well, every time you come across somebody, if you could just go through that thought process, that's the kind of maintenance you'll have to go through with improving your memory. So to answer your question, the first week – a little bit of work, not going to lie. After that, just as you go throughout your normal day, a couple, 10 minutes a day. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you gave the Mona Lisa as an example of a 
a, a way to remember the name Lisa. How would you know that that's for the name Lisa, not for the name Mona? Ah, correct. So you would have to come up with, every, that's a great point, every name needs a distinctive picture. So for the name Mona, I might see somebody in pain and they're moaning. And here's a, a good uh, uh, expanding on that. The name David, I use a divot. You know, when you make a hole in the ground, when you golf, it's a divot. Mm -hmm. So for me, David is a divot. Well, I needed a distinction. Dave is a cave. So there's a distinction between different versions of the same names. So you need to have a unique. Now, here's now here's how you make that. Every Lisa, if you determine it's going to be the Mona Lisa, every Lisa from now on for the rest of your life has to be the Mona Lisa. If you determine Mona is somebody in pain moaning, then every Mona has to be that picture. And that's how you keep from getting confused. You don't change the picture based on the person. Gotcha. Okay. So I remember one of the people you brought up from the audience, and we were supposed to memorize everybody's names, and he had a, a mustache, and uh, you had something coming out of his mustache. Was it money or bills or something? might have been bills. Does this ring a bell? Like the guy I had, uh, yeah. I was named if his Bill. Na his name was Bill. So what I had, shoot yeah. So I had, uh, if I if I had dollar bills shooting out of it, it certainly was his. I had his name was Bill. So I had dollar bills shooting out of his mustache. And here's why: the when you want to remember something, let's take a name for example. The first thing that you do is you look at their face and you observe their face and you pick out something unique on their face. For example, the unique feature on his face was the mustache. Once you've zoned in on that unique feature, the next thing you do is you turn their name into a picture. So let's just say that, you know, this is, it's going to be crazy, but let's say his name was Lisa, all right? We've already determined that the picture for the Mona Lisa, so we would put the Mona Lisa on that mustache, which is, that's crazy, it makes, doesn't make sense, but you get the idea. Yeah. Since his name is Bill, we see dollar bills coming out of the mustache. Here's the point I'm hoping to make. Whatever the distinctive peach feature is on that person's face, that's where we imagine the picture. So since his unique feature was his mustache, we put the dollar bills on his mustache and we with a lot of action. Now, here's the trick to this. The trick is the next time you see that person, you don't try to ask yourself what was their name. You ask yourself, what stood out to me about their face? Oh, yeah, it was his mustache. Now, what was going on on his mustache? Oh, dollar bills were coming out. That leads you to the name Bill. You're not a memory champion, uh, to, to best of my knowledge. You may, you're very intelligent. You're very smart. You have a good memory, but you haven't competed in memory tournaments. If you have, I haven't seen you in the hallways. Yeah. <laughs> nope, I but haven't. But six, seven months later, you can bring, hey, remember that guy we imagined dollar bills flying out of his mustache? I can't it's believe, actually, that I remembered his name was Bill. I, j I remembered his mustache. I remembered something coming out, and then I thought of his name was Bill. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And that's the process that we that we try to go through with everybody. So you, you use um, the the dollar bills for Bill every time, so that if it's money shooting out, it's it's not uh, some other name. It's always Bill. Correct. If 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 it's if it's money coming out, it's always Bill. Now, um, uh, you know, if for the for the woman's name, Penny. I use like a penny, like quarters, nickels, dimes, a penny. Yep. Um, so that would be more like a slot machine. You know, pennies just <laughs> yep. going out. Uh, and maybe let's say Penny has really pretty eyes. So the, the, the pennies would be falling out of her eyes. But that is the idea behind the memory system. You have a picture for every common name, and then you, you see that picture. And that's the hardest part. That's the hardest part. Everybody listening to this right now or watching this right now, they're going to get out there and they're going to try to practice it. And tomorrow they're going to meet somebody and they're going to try to turn that name into a picture. And then they're going to realize they're not listening to the conversation and they're going to get bogged down and they're just going to give up and they're going to say, ah, it's not worth it. At the Initially, it's a little bit cumbersome. And it, you probably won't be able to think of these pictures while you're talking to the people because you're new to it. So my suggestion to you is this. After the conversation is over, when you're driving home or walking home, then ask yourself, what's a picture for that name? And over time, you'll get a lot better and a lot faster at it where you can do it on the spot. Yeah. So you, 
you mentioned during your presentation that as you're walking up to the person to introduce yourself and, and uh, hear their name, um, you're already identifying the feature that you're going to uh, connect with, with their name. And as soon as you hear that name, you are going to uh, associate that image with, with that feature, right? So you're Absolutely. ready to go. That, absolutely. A lot of times when I speak for an audience where there's 100, 200, 300 people in the audience, before I even get a chance to meet them, I'll just be at the back of the room looking at the audience and I'll be like, oh, that, that guy, I'm going to use his uh, hairline. Oh, that guy, I'm going to use his beard. That lady, I'm going to use her eyes or something like that. So e even in a large scale audience, I'm picking out the distinctive features before I meet them. And as I'm walking towards them, I am certainly do that. And then I zone in. Maybe a guy's walking towards me and he's got big ears. And as he's walking towards me, I'm just thinking, okay, his ears stands out to me. Then I say, hey, my name's Ron. What's your name? He says, oh, my name's Steve. Well, the picture for me for Steve is a stove. So I then imagine that stove cooking his ears, what was standing out to me. <laughs> That's awesome. And the more uh, kind of fanciful and... Uh... And and out there, the imagery is the easier it is to to remember it, right? It is. You know what? And that's something I've been saying for a long time. In 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 uh, in, in when I say I've been saying uh, it's not something I came up with. And to reinforce that point, I was reading a book. Uh, it's by Cicero. He lived two thousand years ago, and he had a part in this book where he talks about memory training. And he was saying the brighter you can make the objects, the more outlandish – and he even used the word grotesque. The more grotesque or emotional you can use it, the, long, the more it's going to mean to your memory. And to me, reading that book was just so cool. I'm like, oh my god, this is what I've been saying. And not that I came up with it because I knew I didn't come up with it, but that somebody 2,000 years ago had the exact same thought process. Vivid, emotional, colorful. And he was using this to give speeches or presentations. He was a, a Roman politician uh, in the Roman Senate. Yeah, so cool. And, and um, do you have like a favorite story you want to share about how you were able to use uh, this, this memory technique for names specifically to get a big business deal or to have something pretty remarkable happen just because you were able to remember their name months or years later? Well, um, you know, I have formed a lot of relationships uh, because of remembering names and faces uh, and, 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 and speaking engagements. I got a speaking engagement uh, for Mary Kay Cosmetics, um, which is a big company. Mm -hmm. uh, they were f founded here in Dallas. And one day uh, back in about 2004, I met a woman, and I used to have a public seminar, a two days, and I still sometimes do, but they're rare. But I had this public seminar, and I had a deal. If you signed up for it, you could bring your kids for free. And I was really just getting parents to sign up for it and bring their 12 or 13-year-old kids for free. Well, this woman comes up to me, and she says, Ron, my son is 42. Can he come for free? And I thought, you know, I looked at her name tag. It said, Rena. I said, Rena, for you, anything. I didn't know who Rena was, but I was just, you know, I wanted her to sign up and I didn't care how old her son was. Well, she signed up and before the seminar happened, I saw her at a different event a couple months later or a couple weeks later. And I said, Rena, how are you doing? And she's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you remembered my name. He remembered my name. He remembered my name. And this, she was a retired aged woman. She called me on the phone, um, a couple days later at my office, and she said, Ron, I got a group I want you to speak for. I was so impressed that you remembered my name. Will you, will you speak for them? She was not retired, but she was retired age. And so I just thought, oh, my gosh, this is not going to This is probably going to be a, some rotary club or some, you know, some small meeting in a, at a pancake house in the back room. You know, they got four people there. And I said, Rena, if I have it available, I'll do it. And she, I said, where's the what's the date? She told me the date. I said, I have it available. I said, where is it at? She said the Grapevine Convention Center, which here, it's that's in between Dallas and Fort Worth, and it's a pretty sizable building. And I said, Rena, I was, I mean, I was shocked. I was like, she was asking me to speak there. I said, do you have one of the small rooms there rented out? She said, no, we got the biggest banquet room rented out. I said, what group is this? And she said, this is Mary Kay Cosmetics. Turns out Rena was one of the founders of this company, you know, back in the 70s. 
And when I got up on that stage that day, I gave my speech. She came over. She put her arm around me. And at the end of my speech, she said, ladies, this is Ron White. He is my friend. I want you all to sign up for his memory course. I was like, what? You know, but the, the, to answer your question, how did I become her friend? I remembered her name. I didn't remember her name because I thought she was a rich and powerful woman, which she turned out to be. I remembered her name because she was just a person, and I wanted to give her the respect of remembering her name. But that's a true story of somebody that I remembered, was impressed with the, me remembering their name, and uh, led to business. But I'll tell you this, and, and I'll kind of end this point and go back to you. Most of the time, you know, it, the most meaningful things to me is it leads to a lot of friendships and it makes people feel good. I've really made a point in 2020 to remember 200 new people. And I don't mean at a conference, memorize 200 names and then get off stage and forget about them because I don't see them in six months. I mean, 200 people that I really know that I could see at any point and remember their name. And I have just in the last couple of weeks, I've made so many good friends because of that. And um, that's equally as important to me. Yeah, they say that the sweetest uh, sound to a person is the sound of their name. And, yeah. And uh, I used to believe that I was really bad at remembering names. And then, um, oh, I just, I thought, first of all, that my whole memory was getting worse as I was getting older. So that's kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when you believe that. So it was getting worse because I thought it was getting worse. And then I... I came to this distinction with the help of my friend Amy Africa. She told me about memory gadgets and how there are different uh, parts of the brain that store different types of memories. And so numbers, for example, are in a different memory gadget than uh, than pictures and that sort of thing, which yeah, you know, it's obvious <laughs> when you think about it. It's uh, the visual cortex, et cetera. But the idea that there were these nine different memory gadgets in the brain and that I still had fantastic memory for numbers. It empowered me to and, and changed my perspective. It allowed me to see my strengths instead of uh, weaknesses. And then I changed my belief system around my memory. And then I also got this different distinction that not only is it the sweetest sound of, to hear your own name, but it's also disrespectful to not remember somebody's name. Now, so the, the flip side is I was disrespecting people by not taking the, the time and you, the focus to remember their names. And I didn't want to do that. I'm an empathic, uh, caring person. So those two things combined allowed me to kind of reset my expectations around people's names. And I am quite good now at remembering names. Now, I, I haven't been using your technique. Uh, I really should be, <laughs> except in the case of Bill. Uh, that, right. uh, that's funny. You know, I, I just, I, I loved your talk and I wanted to have you on the podcast and I just kind of filed that away without practicing. And that's the key, right? If you don't, uh, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And I wasn't making permanent this new skill that I had learned from you so that I could remember people's names even better. In this case, seven months later, I uh, can still remember that guy's name. So uh, I think this really underlines the, the importance of, of practicing, but also just changing your mindset about who you are, your beliefs, and not set yourself up for failure, but uh, to you know, cut yourself some slack. Yeah, you know what? That's so true. And there's a lot of things you said in there that was so great. And one of them was is you're getting better at remembering names um, and you're not necessarily using a memory system. But what you're doing is you're focusing on it and you're paying attention. And that's such a big part of the memory. A lot of times when you don't remember a name, it's not because you got a bad memory. It's just you're not focused on it. You're not paying attention. They say what their name is and you're thinking about all this other stuff in your brain. You never even hear their name. You walk away from the conversation and you realize, you know what? I did not even ever hear their name. I didn't even listen when they said their name. And that is the biggest obstacle. So even though you're not maybe implementing a memory system right now, you're focusing. And that is just that's a huge step for memory. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. And I just realized, so I was just at the Strategic Coach uh, uh, Masterminds a couple of days ago, 
and I was thinking, do I do I remember the guys that I sat across from? And uh, heck yeah, I do. I remember Aaron and Chad, uh, and that just goes to show that it's in there. It's 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 captured. Pretty cool. Now you you didn't you weren't born with this skill. So what was it that uh, started you on this journey of becoming a memory champion and, and teaching others this, uh, this uh, technique? Like you must have an origin story that's pretty interesting here. Yeah, so I'm 46 years old now. I'll be 47 in June. And when I was 18 years old, so um, uh, it'll be 29 years this June, uh, I was a telemarketer for a company that cleans chimneys back in 1991. So I was calling up people all day long. Can we come clean your chimney? Can we call, come clean your chimney? Can we clean your chimney? And one day I called this guy and I said, can we clean your chimney? And he said, we don't want our chimney cleaned. We're trying to sell our house. Thanks for calling. And as he was hanging up the phone, I said the words that changed my life. I said, sir, don't hang up the phone. If you're trying to sell your house, you need a clean chimney. He laughed. He said, that's ridiculous, but I do need a good salesman. Do you want to go to work for me? I sell memory training seminars. And he said, I'll pay you more than you're making now, which was you know, a pretty safe gamble on his end. But I went to work for him almost the next day. That was the summer of 1991. And I went to work for him as a telemarketer, a guy who would business people on the idea of how better memory would improve their business. At that point, I had never even taken a memory seminar. I probably worked for him for six weeks before I ever took an actual memory seminar, self experiencing the product myself. And then I, I experienced the product in August of 91. And I, you know what? I wasn't, I was amazed with it, but I was more seeing it as a business. And I think for the next 10 years, maybe eight, nine years, I just focused on the business aspect of it, of selling seminars, that kind of stuff. And then probably around 2001, 2002, 2003, 2001 or two, I decided that I, I decided that I wanted to be a guy who was known as a memory champion, a memory expert. So I set out to win records, set records, do these crazy to memory stunts. And that's really when my business evolved from a guy who sold memory courses to a guy who did the stunts and that kind of stuff. So uh, give me an example of uh, a stunt or two that uh, got you some, I don't know, Guinness World Records or got you on uh, Good Morning America or whatever. Yeah, so, you know, winning the USA Memory Championship in 2009 and 10 and setting the record for the fastest to memorize a deck of cards, you know, that was one. They shuffle up a deck of cards. They set it on a table. They say, go. I picked it up. I looked through it as fast as I could, and then I set it down. One minute and 27 seconds elapsed. Then I picked up another deck, reassembled that one to match the first deck. They flipped them over, and it was a USA record. That same day, I memorized 167 digit cons consecutive digits in five minutes, and that was also a USA record. So I did that in 2009, and then, you know, the next thing you know, I'm sitting next to Martha Stewart and Dr. Oz and Good Morning America and the CBS Early Show. But really, the biggest breakthrough for me did not come out of my memory tournament wins. In 2009 and 10, I was the USA memory champion. In 2011, I came in second place uh, to a guy named Nelson Dallas. And I thought, man, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? And that is really, if I had won that year, I know what I would have done. I would have set out to defend my title. And if I had set out to defend my title, the next project would never have happened, which is my biggest. And that is, I am a veteran of the military. I was in Afghanistan. So in 2011-12, I decided to memorize everybody who died in the war in Afghanistan from the U.S. military in the order of their death. Now, there's 2,400 of them. So I memorized their rank, their first name, their last name. It's 7,000 words. And I write it out on a wall. So here's the image. You're, imagine this. You're standing at the Vietnam Wall, and you're watching somebody write out the Vietnam Wall, but they're doing it from memory. That's exactly what I do for Afghanistan. It takes me 11 hours to write out all 7,000 words. And that is without question. That, that if you want to call it – and I hate to use the word stunt for that because it's so meaningful and it's a tribute to people who are no longer alive. So for that, I'll say for that demonstration, uh, that has gotten me on um, – and I didn't do it for the media recognition. I did it as a tribute. But that certainly did get a lot of recognition. Wow, that's amazing. How did you get the idea for that? Uh, 
the idea came from looking at the Vietnam Wall. Somebody asked me, how long would it take you to memorize the Vietnam Wall? And there's 60,000 people on the Vietnam Wall. And I was an idiot when I answered the question. I said, well, I can memorize 155 names in 15 minutes at the USA Memory Championship, which is true. So then I multiplied that by four. And I'm like, so that means I can do 600 names an hour, which is not true. Because what I wasn't calculating in is the more names you get, the longer the review is. And and the, it actually slows down the process. But I was naive and I said, I, so I could do 600 names an hour. There's 60,000 names. Um, I could do it in about 100 hours. I could do it in a couple of weeks. And they were like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm serious. Turns out I'm so wrong. <laughs> because what is, and I'm glad they never asked me to do it. But, the, but that was the genesis of the idea. And then I realized I should do it for Afghanistan because that's where I served. But a one small point on that. When you memorize something, you have to go back and review and make it solid before you really progress to the next thing. So to memorize all 7,000 words for everybody who who died in Afghanistan, there were some weeks, weeks, where all I was doing was just reviewing, reviewing the previous 1,000 names. Mm. So that's something that I hadn't calculated and something that I actually learned during that process. Gotcha. Now, do you memorize your speeches or do you just uh kind of ad lib or uh have have a more organic process for that well my speech is certainly um my speech is certainly memorized initially in 1991 uh, i memorized the outline of my speech 100 percent and then over time um I still follow the same outline, but I don't need to use my memory cues anymore. I just now I just know it. You can say, oh, this is where you are and I'll I'll pick up from there. But when I initially learned it, it was memorized using the memory system. It's the the system that I use for that's called the mind palace or the memory palace. It's actually what Cicero wrote about in that book that I was reading uh, two days ago. Uh, but I'll say now that a little bit of it is ad libbed because, you know, somebody says something funny and I want to respond or react to it. That is certainly ad libbed. So it's not so structured where I can't sh- kind of stray from it. And I do. Mm, OK, got it. Now, are, are you uh, using a particular technique for memorizing the outline um, or would you recommend a technique for our listener who gives speeches to memorize their speech outline using, let's say, memory palaces or to uh, use some other approach? I would act 100% recommend the memory palace method. And um, it's it's the method that I use. It's the method that have you, that's been used by hundreds of years. Um, uh, uh, here's the memory palace method of the mind palace technique. It's where you visualize a building and you use that building and and Cicero and I keep bringing up this book, but I just read it two days ago, and it was just so I just loved it. I loved it, and the reason that I loved it is, is like, oh my gosh, he's talking about the exact same thing that I'm doing two thousand years later, and I've never read this book. Now I've learned it because it's been passed down in the generations, but this is almost the original, the almost the original source. And here's the concept behind it: you use locations and rooms as places to store data. Over here behind me, I have an alien. So that would be my number one location if we were using this room. That my that now, door now for right one there, who's listening, not seeing the video here, that might out of context sound pretty weird. So this is a statue of an alien. <laughs> Just to oh, clarify. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. No, no, no. This guy's from Mars. He's he's hanging out with me. Hey man, how you liking it here? Yeah. So there's a statue of an alien over there. And then behind him is the door. There's a mask hanging on the wall. And over here is a is a computer and over here is a window. So that's five locations around this room. The, the idea of the mind palace is, is you you say you close your eyes and you say them over and over. Number one is an alien, two is a door, three is a mask, four is a computer, five is a window. And you get them ingrained in your memory. And you get them ingrained so well that you don't even have to think about it. Now, clearly, these aren't going to be the locations in your room. You're going to do your own. And most people don't have a statue of an alien. But once you have these selected this becomes your mind palace then you take the outline of the speech you want to give and you kind of imagine it 
each point on each location. So the aliens, my number one location, let's say the first point I want to talk about is how to make more money. All of a sudden, I imagine money shooting out the top of his head. Uh, the next point I want to talk about is how to manage your time effectively. So I might imagine a grandfather clock on the door. In other words, you're taking the points of your speech, inter interlaying them with the pieces of furniture. And then when you get up to give the speech, you just think back to this room and talk about what you see occurring on these locations. Wow. That is so cool. And it, it makes me think that if you use a PowerPoint as a crutch, like I've, I've done many times, and I'm sure some of our listeners have too, that is going to really mess you up if there's some sort of technical glitch and your PowerPoint isn't able to be displayed. Like I, I just spoke at Blogger last week, for example, and the slides, the, sl the, the, the PowerPoint was displayed on TVs that were only available for the audience to see. There was no confidence monitor and the positioning didn't allow us to see um, from the stage the PowerPoint slides. And there were a lot of items on these slides. Normally, I just have one or two words per slide, or maybe a, a three or four max. But in this case, they made us use their PowerPoint template, and it had a, all the, you had to basically fill it with content, otherwise it looked bizarre. Uh, and I couldn't have the normal sort of background image. So I have a metaphorical image associated with each slide. So if I'm going to talk about, um, I don't know, making money, I might have uh, somebody in the club making it rain, right, as in the background right. and as the image. And then maybe the text of it is make it rain. And then I talk about here's how you make money, passive income, da, 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 da. And that's, that's the topic for that little section. Couldn't do that with this particular deck. And so I felt kind of lost when uh, we couldn't see the slides, my daughter, uh, my, my oldest daughter is also an SEO expert, and she was on the panel, or it was a co-presentation. So I hopped off of the stage, and I was speaking from almost in the audience so that I could see the screen, and I wouldn't have had that issue. I could have just uh, have had the, the whole talk memorized, essentially, or at least the outline of it, by using the memory palace technique that you just described. Yeah, you know, that's a great example. And wow, it's, that is kind of a, as a speaker, that's kind of that, that gives me that it's, it's a, that's like one of those nightmares. Like literally you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh, my gosh, oh my gosh, that's a terrible dream. But that really happened. Um, but, you know, another thing, you know, the PowerPoint does is is it, and there's nothing wrong with having a PowerPoint. But if if we're relying on it, sometimes we tend to read it and then we're just we're, it's not as a, a dynamic or a, yeah. a a charismatic speech if we're reading a PowerPoint. So, you know, I was in the military for uh, eight years, and my job in the military was to give military briefings. So we had I had to use a PowerPoint. There, I mean, it was like that's protocol. You're not going to get up there and just wing it. So I had the PowerPoint, but what I did was is I had each on like this room. I would have the five points that were on that slide. And then I, I and then on the next piece of furniture, if I needed to to go to the next slide, I would always put a piece of wood breaking, like a karate chop, and that told me. And you can use whatever you want; it doesn't matter. But that's just what I used. That told that way. I never had to look at the slides. I would talk and talk and talk and talk until I saw that board getting chopped in half, and then I clicked the the advanced slide. It went to the next slide, and I talked about what was on that slide until I got to the next karate chop. And then I click that and people are like, oh, my God, he's flipping this PowerPoint. He's not even looking at it to advance the slides. <laughs> That's but... <laughs> pretty ninja. I like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I like that a lot. I'm going to use that. Uh, do you have a course that you teach on memory specifically for public speakers? Well, I don't have a specific course for public speakers, although I should, and I'm hoping to develop something just for speakers. Um, I do have an overall course. Uh, it's called Black Belt Memory, and inside of that, there is a portion for speakers. Okay. And how long does it take to go through your course? Well, you know, uh, that depends on the user. I've had some people go through it in two days, which is really, really rare. Uh, that's, And I don't even necessarily recommend it. I don't think you have time, time to digest it. 
Yeah. I'd say the average person can go through it and digest it and think about it in two weeks or something like that. And then, like I said, after that, it just becomes maintenance. It, you you start turning numbers into pictures. When I drive down the road and I see license plates, I'm always turning them into pictures, the numbers. Not so much anymore, but in the beginning stages. Uh, that's the maintenance part that you got to keep up until you really perfect it. Do you ever feel like uh, you're putting stuff into memory f for no good reason? Like, uh, I remember reading s some comment on one of my past episodes where we did cover uh, memory and the person was upset it was very surprising to me this person uh, was upset because they couldn't forget things like they had yeah. this didactic memory or you know kind of uh, uh, indelible memory that was a curse and yeah. uh, they they kind of took me to task for uh, assuming that everybody would want more skills with their memory. And um, yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we live in an age where people are looking to get offended over stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> Maybe. if you're teaching a skill for people who want to improve their memory and somebody gets offended over that, I'm, uh, if they're listening to this, email me directly and we'll talk about it, I guess. But uh, I would say that... Uh, you know, maybe, you know, there are people like Mary Lou Henner. Uh, she was an actress. She was on Taxi. And they have these autobiographical memories where you can say a day and they will remember that. It, like you can say June 12th, 1985, and she can tell you when. So I could see that as being a curse. I would also say that that's very rare. It's been documented in very few few people. And I would also say that we all have painful memories. All of us have painful memories. We know where we were and how it felt when we had our heart broken or when something emotional happened or we lost somebody that we cared about. So that is painful. But to say that the av that a person is not going to benefit from being learning a skill to give a presentation from memory or to learn their history subject faster or to uh, learn names and faces that – even a person who can't forget painful memories wouldn't benefit from a memory system. I just find that hard to believe. So yeah. uh, if you're out there, I'd love to hear your point of view. Yeah. Now, does this help with uh, with speed reading? Like if uh, I wanted to read that Cicero book uh, quickly, I, I – I take a while to read a book and I'll get bored quickly and move on to another book before finishing it. So I don't finish very many books. I start a lot more books than I finish. Right. Right. So I'm curious if there's a, uh, applicability here for speed reading with what you're teaching. I think there is. And I, um, you know, I'm not, uh, if, if, if there's, you know, somebody else who's in the memory world, I'd go head to head with them in any competition, and I pretty much could hold my own. I mean, with you know, I'm I'm still going to get beat by uh, quite a few people out there, but I'm still re I can still consider myself a top memory expert. Uh, speed reading, I I see myself as somebody who uses it, but I wouldn't. I'm I'm not doing speed reading tournaments. I guess if that makes sense. Yeah. So this is what I use it for as a average or ordinary everyday reader the real the key to speed reading for me and i think for the the person most people who are using it is what slows us down most about a reading is our eye bounces around the page it kind of it does not go on in a smooth thought so i read with a pen or a pencil hmm. and as i read when i come to something interesting i underline it or highlight it but i keep that pencil going across the page and by keeping that pencil going across the page, it forces my eye to keep going, which keeps me engaged, but also keeps me going faster and faster. And I don't try to go too fast. Um, I've been, you know, I do have a speed reading course that I teach where I'm teaching you what I'm teaching you right now. But I also subscribe to the theory that you need to go slow enough to where it sinks in and you're actually learning the material, which is maybe something odd for you to hear somebody who talks about speed reading, but I, I do think there's a, a fine line there. Uh, so that's my suggestions for speed reading, though. Read with a pen or a pencil to keep your eye moving across the page, and then when you get to something important, underline it or highlight it, and then when you get done with that chapter, go back and look at all the stuff you've underlined and highlighted to kind of reinforce the important parts in your memory. 
Yeah. And if you are in the habit of re- kind of reading it to yourself aloud, but in your mind, that can slow you down. And if you can shut your internal voice up so that you're just scanning it without hear- hearing yourself uh, speak what you're reading, that that's going to be helpful to you, right? Oh, absolutely. And it sounds like you've done some research on this and you're absolutely right. You know, they call that uh, subvocalization or where you're in a lot of times they say if you if you hum to yourself <laughs> or chew gum or listen to classical music in the background, it can help you not do that uh, uh, because it's kind of filling your mind with something else that's steady or whatever. Uh so it works for some people and some people it doesn't. Some people, though, it works for them to go read at a Starbucks or a coffee shop to not vocalize because they have a little bit of distraction going on around them. Yeah. Another, another area that I, I think this applies to is note taking. If I'm at an event, I take notes and the kind of device I'm using is not a laptop. It's I'm not putting stuff into Evernote on my phone. I am using a ta- uh, this tablet called the Remarkable. So yes, I have that. Oh, hang on one second. Yep. Yes, here's my remarkable. Yep, <laughs> here's mine. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, I love this thing. It it has a great feel to it. It doesn't have glare. Uh, it doesn't have distractions. I can't surf the internet or check my email or move stuff around on my to do list. It's just for taking notes. And uh, it does sync in the cloud, so I, if I get Wi-Fi uh, yes. connectivity, I, I, I love it. And what I don't end up doing <laughs> is going back and reviewing my notes, which I, I, I want to, but then, I don't know, life gets in the way or whatever. And there's good stuff in there, including things that are actions. I, I have separate pages uh, in the workbooks or in the in the. Uh, yeah, in the workbooks and in, in, in the Remarkable tablet that I dedicate to actions. So I'm taking notes, I'm learning the material and everything, and then if it's an action I want to take, like, oh, yeah, I actually want to take this personality test. Uh, like, for example, I'd learn about the print assessment on um, from Strategic Coach. Really excited about taking that, and I, uh, I did end up taking it, but... That went in my action list, which I never went back and and reviewed. I never loaded the stuff that I wrote in on my Remarkable uh, in, into my to do list. I use things on 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 the Mac for keeping my to dos. So one uh, thing that this m- memory technique or set of techniques could help with for me at least is in the note taking. Maybe I don't have to do as much note taking if i am uh committing to memory using let's say memory palaces or what have you some of the material that i'm most uh wanting to to learn i don't know if that does that make sense or is, is am i going to maybe fill up my memory palaces so much that i can't uh there's no room for other things that i really need to remember no, well, first of all, I think you always have – you could create more memory palaces. I memorized you know, the, the 2400 from Afghanistan, and then this summer I memorized the United States Constitution word for word, which is 4,500 words. So I have used my house, my friend's house, my cousin's house, my favorite restaurant, my favorite bar, my favorite sports stadium, uh, my favorite – I don't really have a favorite hotel, but there's a hotel downtown that I know because it's two or three blocks from me. So I would say to you is this. I love – I, when I go to a conference, this is a conference, and I'm certainly not advertising the conference. Well, so I'll just sh- flip the page, but it doesn't matter. It's it's an internet marketing conference. And yeah, here's was that war here's room? My, huh? Was that war room? No, this was. I'm a fan of them, though. I've been to Ryan Dyson. <laughs> this was this was quick fun. Oh right, right. Yeah, I heard that uh, Funnel Hacker Live was uh, was good. It just happened. Yeah, this I didn't go this year. This was. Uh, 2019. Okay. But I am a guy, I, I am constantly filling up notebooks. Uh, I don't take notes much on my laptop or an iPad. I'll either do it on the Remarkable because I think there's something about writing stuff down that I just really like. I think it even helps my memory. So this is what I would say. When I go to a conference, I might write out, okay, here are the things that I want to learn from it. 
To put it in your memory in a mind palace, I don't personally do it during the conference. I like to focus on the speaker and focus on writing it down, not memorizing it at all. But after it's over, after that session is over, it's probably the most excited I'm ever going to be about that session. And it's probably just going to diminish over time. No matter how great it is, that's the most excited I'll ever be. So at that point, what I would like to do probably is go back and using a mind palace, pick 10 or 15 things from my notes that really stood out to me, place them around the mind palace, and then close the book. Then go to dinner that night, and if I'm having dinner alone, review my mind palace. As I'm going to sleep that night, review it. As I'm getting up to go to the next day two of the conference, review what I learned. And then I would say that over time, it's either going to solidify in your memory if you really like the information, Mm-hmm. But if you find out, well, you know what? I really didn't even like that. that. I don't think that's true anymore or whatever. Don't review it and then use those locations for other stuff. Yep. I will say this. This is the last point I'll say on this. You can reuse your mind palace over and over and over again for different conferences or different topics. But if you use it for, let's say, an SEO conference and you got 10 things that you need to know for SEO, then you go to another SEO conference the next day or the next week, I would use a different mind palace. However, if you went to a conference on leadership, you could use the same mind palace and not get confused. Gotcha. Okay. What about using the location where the event was held for your mind palace? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, um, you certainly could. You know... uh, I, this book is so fresh in my mind, I'm going to quote it again. But the book by Cicero said that he even used imaginary locations. Like he imagined a building and it didn't even exist, but he imagined it. Mm. But he said that it's, he. That's kind of like that's Minecraft. Less... He was playing uh, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> so he did say in that book he thinks it's less, it's less uh, effective, the imaginary ones. But you know what? You bring up a great point. You could use a video game. You could use a video game as a mind palace. Um, I don't tend to use the room the conference was in unless – here's what I do in that situation. This might seem extreme, but since I don't know that room and I'll probably never see it again, I might just get my camera and take 10 spots around the room and then put those 10 spots in a PowerPoint. So now those are my 10 locations, and then I could memorize that room as a mind palace. Matter of fact, when I memorized the United States Constitution, 4,500 words, I went around downtown Fort Worth with my cell phone and I walked inside of a restaurant and I took 10 or 15 pictures discreetly so I didn't get thrown out. I took 10 or 15 <laughs> pictures in a hotel and then I went back and I put these four or 500 pictures in a four or 500 slide PowerPoint and I just memorized the route. So if it's a place that I'm not really familiar with, my house, my friend's house, my mom's house, my cousin's house, then that's what I'll do just to make sure I remember the mind palace. That is a great idea because I do like the uh, the concept of using the event's venue. Yeah. But then I don't – like I, I remember much more vividly the uh, venue for uh, the big table event that we were both at, yeah. speaking at than I do, for example, um, I don't know, let's say the SEO Day conference where I, I keynoted a, a session there in, it was in Denmark. I have very wow. little memory of that location. Like I wouldn't be able to use that as a, uh, uh, as a memory palace it's just it wasn't it wasn't that memorable and uh it was a much bigger room and kind of nondescript so i i would use that idea of of taking photos of of the room if i wanted to use it as a memory palace that's a great idea um now you mentioned something important i want to reiterate i've heard this too that uh you don't take as uh, into memory as much the uh, information that you, you're rec- like uh, recording during your note taking if you're typing it compared to if you are handwriting it. So I don't remember where I learned that from. I just found that to be personally true 
because uh, I have taken plenty of notes on my laptop or on my iPad or on my F iPhone using Evernote, and it's so much more uh, effective for me to either use the Remarkable tablet and hand write into uh, that the uh, the notes or to hand write it into a, a notepad or notebook. Way, I, way better. I I believe that's true too. That I feel the exact same way. Handwriting it cements it into my memory much more. I believe that. And I uh, uh, listen to Joe Rogan's podcast. Other than yours, it's sure the only two I listen to. Uh, but wow, I listen that's to high praise, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Joe Rogan said the exact same thing on a podcast I listened to just a few days ago. He was talking about the – he felt there was something magical. I don't know if that's the word he used, but there was something special about taking notes by hand instead of typing it in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, also I've heard that when you are taking notes, let's say somebody has a PowerPoint that they're presenting off of and you are typing your notes in, you tend to just uh, – kind of wrote type in what is on the screen without the the deeper comprehension whereas if you're handwriting it you're not taking uh you know d direct uh notes off the screen you're actually thinking about it more and that helps you with the retention and the comprehension you know what i i believe that's true and and, and, and kind of on that same thought but kind of from a different angle, you know, when we re when we're trying to review something, so we've we've already we're we're taking a history test or whatever we're SEO whatever we've learned about a topic. If we review by just reading again, engaging our brain in the review, we're just reading it again. If we can turn over the paper and not look at the paper, but review by seeing how much we can remember about what was on the paper then we're engaging our brain in the review, and so we will remember it more. And I have never heard it said the way you just said it, that writing down engages our brain, but I believe that's true, and I believe there's some similarities there, that you are engaging your brain in the process, and because of that, it's going to be stronger knowledge for you. Yeah, yeah. Now, you, uh, when you were describing walking the streets of downtown and and – um, using that as as your kind of cues to to remember the Constitution, that reminded me of a video that you showed in your session in your presentation of this little kid who um, was remembering I forget what, but whatever it was, uh, she would run around from room to room, and you'd follow her taking video of her going and, and then reciting all the stuff as she was going from room to room and then from uh, different kind of trigger um, uh, pieces of furniture and things like that. Uh, do you want to share a little bit more about what that the, the uh, importance of that video and how that uh, what that demonstrated? Yeah, you have, you have a, a fantastic memory. Uh, that was a little <laughs> six-year-old little girl uh, probably about 10 years ago. So that girl's 16 now. But uh, she was a, a friend of mine's kid at the time, and uh, that friend uh, had seen – I teach public seminars, or I did at the time a lot, where I teach adults how to memorize the presidents of the United States. Well, this little six-year-old girl had seen that, and, um, and she came to me one day, and she said, I want you to teach me how to memorize the presidents of the United States. And she was six years old. I didn't think there – there was 44 presidents at the time. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking there's no way she's going to be able to get this. So I don't even want to not waste my time, but it wasn't it wasn't so much about wasting my time because I would have loved it. I loved interacting with her, but it would have been about the letdown she would have felt or the frustration she would have felt when she wasn't able to do it. So I was like, no, nah, no, nah, let's not do that. We'll, we'll do that another time. And she was so persistent. She said, no, come on. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe how persistent she is. So we went around the house, and we numbered 44 pieces of furniture. But I said, okay, Kaylee, this this is number one over here. The president is Washington. What does that sound like to you? She said, it sounds like a washing machine. I said, imagine you're putting in the clothes. You're putting in the soap. Now spin it around. And she you know, spent 60 seconds playing with that piece of furniture, imagining it was a washing machine. And I said, before we move on to the next piece of furniture, I want you to say Washington washing machine. 
So she said, Washington washing machine. And we did that with 44 pieces of furniture. A cooler, like a water cooler for Coolidge. A dam for Adams. 44 pieces of furniture. We did about a minute to two minutes a piece of furniture with the review. So it took us maybe an hour and a half, maybe. And then this little six-year-old girl runs through the house, pointing to each piece of furniture. She says the presidents. She says I'm in order. I'm like, oh, my God, if I get this on video, I'm going to make a million dollars. So I'm like, Kaylee, will we do this one more time, but can I film it? And she said, you can film it for a dollar. So I'm like, oh, my God, I, I got that <laughs> out. I recorded it. And that is the video that you saw that day. Just so cute. Yeah. But what it reinforces is, is you can remember anything as long as you have pieces of furniture and the pictures are crazy enough and bizarre enough. Yeah. Well, I think another thing, too, to, to uh, kind of inject into this is you got to have the desire to do it. Like if you don't yeah. have the desire to remember somebody's name, you're not even going to bother, even if you have the right. tool. Uh, if, if you want to remember the 45 presidents uh names then you're ha the ha you've you've already uh tackled half the battle right because you have the desire to do it uh so that that was pretty cool that she showed so much uh, desire at such a young age to to memorize that that's that's awesome and and um another point i want to uh mention here that i think is um is key is that you have to engage your visual cortex Right, so you spend the sixty seconds with her at, at each kind of station where she's visualizing it, where her visual cortex lights up. If if uh, you were to do like a, a functional MRI scan uh, or a SPECT scan or whatever the right scan is to check where the activity is happening in the brain, the visual cortex would have been lit up. If you just tried to go through the motions quickly and you didn't actually visualize it your visual cortex didn't light up uh good luck getting this uh memory palace thing to work i think well not only uh that that's you you ended that statement with i think i can tell you that's a hundred percent true not verified by me i'm just a guy who has a a good memory system verified by university of texas scientist uh there was a history channel show called stanley's superhuman stanley's the guy who invented the incredible hulk well uh, before you know he died clearly this was a tv show and the stanley superhumans had me on their show they took me to the university of texas for the history channel show they put me in one of those brain scans that and watched what parts of my brain were lit up when i memorized they determined I, – I, I got the only perfect score on this memory test in the 20-year history of that test. It's not because of anything special about me. It's because I'm the only guy who laid in that tube who used the, who used the mind palace. Okay, that's the truth. <laughs> but when the I came out, the, the University of Texas scientists said that 45% more of my brain was activated – than the average person when they memorize. And it was the exact part of the brain you're talking about, the visual cortex, the parts responsible for memory. And then Stanley's Superhumans, you know, the, that was about a show looking for real life superheroes. So they were kind of made it mis mysterious. They were like, oh, was Ron born with this special ability to gave, engage more of his cortex, visual cortex? And I was like, no, 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 it's a system. But they cut that out. But it's okay. <laughs> it's a system, and you can get it at www. <laughs> right. By the way, what is the website address for uh, for your your system? Well, I have my course is called Black Belt Memory. You know, when you're the best in uh, Taekwondo, you get a black belt in Taekwondo. When you complete my course, you get a black belt in memory. So people can go to blackbeltmemory.com. They can get a free gift there just for checking it out. But then, of course, see if they want to get the course. Okay, and so if they visualize what you might look like, uh, actually they'll have the, the, the picture of you, even if they're only listening to the episode, they'll have the picture of you on the, on the episode uh, cover. So they could visualize you with, uh, let's say, a black belt wrapped around your head. Yeah. And uh, maybe the, the word memory written on your forehead. Yeah. And that will remind them of the URL, blackbeltmemory.com, so they don't even have to write it down. They don't have to go check out the show notes for this episode, which they should anyways. 
Yeah. <laughs> but they can uh, just go to blackbeltmemory.com and they will be able to remember that URL. That's pretty darn cool. Well, I uh, I appreciate you taking that much time to create the picture for them. You are a fantastic host. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, the pleasure was all mine. So thank you so much for uh, sharing all your great stories and your techniques and all all the uh, just the the powerful uh, difference you've made for so many people out there in the world, including six year olds. That's really awesome. Thanks for joining us. Hey, I appreciate it. It was an honor to be on the show, and I look forward to seeing you again. Likewise.